Welcome to Anthem. I am so glad that you're here. My name is Miguel. I have the pleasure and privilege, the honor really, of being one of the shepherds in this community. I get to do life with you. And we are so thrilled that you have decided to step into this place because perhaps, and just perhaps, this moment will be transformational, not only for today, but for the rest of your life. We want to give a special welcome to those of you who are here for the first time. We recognize that there are some people in our community that are coming because we have a wonderful event that we've put on this weekend called Sunscreen. It's a collection of Christian filmmakers that have come and descended in this space to consider what art that celebrates the majesty of Jesus ought to look like. And so if you are part of this group, we just want to wish you a warm welcome. Even if you're not, if this is the first time that you have decided to come to Anthem, we really hope that this will be the home in which the miracle of discipleship occurs. If you are a first-time guest, we have a, a little gift just to show you how appreciative we are. And you can get that by simply texting 55498. Fill out that, uh, put your name on there, and you can fill out first-time guest, and we'd love, love to connect with you. We've got some things going on in Anthem uh, because we here at this community believe that the ways in which you connect are both through your presence and through your giving. And so if you are or if you want to partner with us in this experiment of bringing hope and healing to the world, we want to ask you to partner with us. You can do that in two ways. You can actually text your gift to 55498 or as the baskets go around, you can deposit uh, your love offerings there. As those baskets are going around, we want to invite you to consider some events that are coming up. Now, I know that every one of us, as we journey through this broken world, have at some point experienced loss. Well, we've got on April 20th, a grief seminar put on by Mike and Pam Tucker, the title of which is Good Grief. It is actually gonna teach us some principles to deal with the loss. And if that's something that you are interested in, we would love, love for you to register, LOUC.org. Uh, fill it in. We'd love to see you here. Now, Anthem is this ministry, part of a church that has four services. And if you've ever seen all the output that we do, we you will recognize that media is a huge, huge piece of all we do. Now, we want to do something here that we do in our main sanctuary, and that is we'd love to have an opportunity to get what happens in this church out to the world. That happens through live streaming. And so if you're interested in becoming one of those volunteers, maybe uh, operating a camera or helping with the editing or the sound, we'd love for you to partake of that. Again, 55498, that is how you get connected and you volunteer. Here at Anthem, we not only believe that what matters is what goes outside, what matters is the community that happens inside. Now, you don't have to know everyone, but you do have to know someone. And so we've got a, our new small group season. It is starting a week from Sunday. It is running all the way to the week of May 5th and it is dealing with prayer. Now there's two ways in which you can participate of our Anthem small groups. You can either come and say, hey, we've got people, uh, we've got a leader, we've got, uh, we do life together, we wanna continue experiencing and experimenting through scripture. Or you can say, hey, uh, we wanna meet some new people. Uh, Either way, 55498, or you can talk to our lovely volunteers in our Discipleship Center, and that is how you get signed up. So, all of that is what's happening in your community, but now is the most important part, the spoken word, the moment where we delve into Scripture. So take out your pens, your Bibles, but more importantly, open up your heart as we share in the message for today. May God richly bless you on the Sabbath. Good morning, Anthem. Good morning. You all out?
out there? Good morning. morning. Excellent. This morning when we started, our first service was really cold out there. I went in, I was greeting, my hands were a little stiff. Now, it's gorgeous. These are the reasons for which we live in Southern California. So, <laughs> Great to see you this morning. So if you're on your way through school, or if you think back to the years you were in school, you no doubt had the same experience that I've had and that others that I've known have had, have had, and that is thinking about a class you may be in and wondering, how does this class have anything to do with my life ahead of this place? How does this connect in any way? A friend of mine, for example, was a couple of years ahead of me in college and theology, went to seminary a couple of years before I did, told me, I took a class in the Gospel of John that was one of the most dense, difficult classes to follow and understand. But our professor said to us very clearly, every single issue we deal with in this class, you're going to face once you get out into your parishes. He said, I've been a pastor for decades and I haven't faced a single one of those issues. They're like what in the world? They had nothing to do with what I'm doing now. That kind of experience. Or for me, it was, well, not only one, but it was certainly included college algebra. Man, that quarter, semester, whatever they call that period of suffering that I spent was, I could not put that stuff together in my head. The teacher, the professor, was a wonderful professor. I love him to this day, Dr. Watson Chin, one of the most intelligent and gracious people I've ever known. It wasn't him. It was the concepts. And it was like, how quadratic quadratic, what? What does quadratic mean? You know, it was that kind of thing. And then halfway through... I broke my arm, had to have a surgery, missed a week, and after that, it was like just all on the grace of Dr. Chin getting through that class. And you know, ironically, I did not this past week in trying to exegete Luke Aches ask the question, how does college algebra inform this? <laughs> I didn't ask that question. So sometimes you say, well, that has nothing to do with this. Or one of the key places for me was for, I don't remember, a year, year and a half, 12 years, something like that. I took voice lessons in college. It was rough. I mean, after however long that time was, I gave up, and the voice teacher, doctorally trained, quit and went and sold real estate. <laughs> and I've spent the last years telling myself there was no connection between those two things, I hope. I don't use that now, I mean, almost ever. So it's easy to look at one thing, here's the class, high school, college, even graduate school, and here's life, and these two don't connect. With that in mind, we've been in a series, a series called Understandable, trying to say we can understand Scripture, we can read it, and we can understand it, but we face the same challenge there. It's easy for this to end up having nothing to do with that. And that's a problem. In fact, I want to put a statement on the board that I hope is, is the entire reality of what we're talking about today. And that is, now I'm going to put one of these words in parentheses because some might contest that it's that important, although I would say it is, that the primary purpose of Scripture, in other words, when we come to reading the Bible, studying the Bible, the primary pur purpose of Scripture is not to inform, but to transform. Not to inform, but to transform. Meaning that there needs to be a deep and decided connection between what it is that I'm reading and studying here and what it is that I'm living out here in my life in the world. Now, years ago, Previous senior pastor at this church was Dr. William Lovis, Dr. Bill Lovis. One week in his sermon, he said, you know, in a community like this one, we're in danger of becoming tadpoles. You know what tadpoles are, right? They're, they're transitioning from being these little tiny tadpoles to becoming frogs. You see some of them on the screen. He said, we're in danger of becoming tadpoles where we have all head and very little body. Because we're on an academic campus, and so our focus is learn, 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 study, study, study. And we keep growing and growing, growing here. But then our activity, the way our lives are lived out of that, 
sometimes leave a lot to be desired. Now, I don't want to say that information, being informed, is bad. We want people who learn and learn and learn and are informed, right? You don't want to go into your doctor's office, your dentist's office, your attorney's office, your mechanic's office, your contractor's office, and have them not know what they're talking about. You don't want that. Information is very important. In fact, Charles Steinmetz, very well-known, very famous U.S. electrical engineer, was asked by GE at one point to come and, and, and fix something, figure out what was wrong. They had some big turbines, engines, I don't know what they were, machines that weren't working right, and they thought he could help them. They couldn't figure out what the problem was. So he came. He wandered around for a while, looked at things, examined things, listened to things. And finally, he put an X on one of the machines, said, your problem is there. You open that up and fix such and so, you'll be fine. So their electrical engineers did exactly that, found exactly the problem, fixed it. Everything worked great. So they're like, yeah, Steinmetz, we're great. And then they got his bill. Now, this was decades ago. His bill was $10,000 for about an hour of wandering around and putting an X on something. And they said, what, what, what's that about? Please send us an itemized bill. So he did. Had two lines on it. First line said, putting an X on the machine, $1. Knowing which machine to put the X on, $9,999. We need people who know where to put the X. No question about that. We need people who know how to read, how to understand Scripture. But if that's all we do... We never get to what I would contend is the primary purpose or one of the primary purposes of Scripture, and that is transformation, becoming the kind of people God calls us to become. So in this series, we've been talking about different things. We've talked about how it is that we bridge the distance between the biblical world and our world. We've talked about the importance of genre in understanding Scripture. We've said, hey, you can't translate or interpret every single genre in the same way. Psalms is read differently than Revelation, which is read differently than the epistles. We've paid attention to that. We've talked about the importance of context. We've talked about how important it is to look for the main character. Where is Christ in this? What does God look like? What does this inform us about God? All of those and others are key to understanding Scripture. However, if this is all we do, it is easy to end up with a great deal of information and no transformation. And that means we haven't fulfilled one of the primary foci of Scripture. So what do we do about that? We come today to the last in this series, Understandable. It's been longer than we'd originally intended. It's gotten stretched by several things. But I want to suggest to you that what we talk about today, if it's missing, means that we will never fully and deeply understand what God is doing in our lives. So for that, we go to Luke's Gospel, the 8th chapter. If you've been following this series, you may have been reading through Luke's Gospel. You've read it all the way through now. Some of you have read it through more than one time. You've been getting a flavor and a feel for Luke and Jesus as he portrays him. So you've read this passage. It's called the parable of the sower. In fact, in my Bible, the NIV, that's the title the translators give to it, the parable of the sower. I want to argue today, and it's not just me, many commentators say the same thing, that this is the parable much more of the soils than it is of the sower. So let's read what happens. Luke 8, beginning in verse 4, says, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told them this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path it was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. 
When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. It's a parable of the soils. And Jesus, in this parable, talks about four kinds of soil. The first soil is what I might call pathway soil. Anybody who's been in an agrarian culture, country, or economy, or if you've just lived out in the country, you know what this is like. This is the place where people begin to walk, and then animals begin to walk, and then bicycles begin to ride, and maybe some kind of vehicles begin to drive. It's not paved, but it becomes the pathway. And as it becomes the pathway, it gets increasingly harder and harder and harder. In some cases, depending on the texture of the soil, it can become almost as hard as pavement. That's the first. Jesus says, when the sower throws it out, some of it falls on the pathway. It's hard. The seed does not penetrate. There's no moisture. The seed just lies there on the surface. The birds come, eat it up. That's the end of it. That's the first soil. Second soil, he says, is rocky soil. Now, this soil does have soil, and it has enough soil where it can get enough moisture that the seeds actually begin to grow. They, they send out roots that go down somewhat until they start hitting rock, run out of soil. They start to grow up, but soon they die. They die because there's no way to get deeper roots and to get more moisture. So that's the end of the story there. Then he says there's a third kind of soil. And this soil is full of weeds. Now what that tells us is that this soil... It's fertile soil. Things grow in this soil. There aren't rocks. It's not hard. They grow. And so the plants that grow from the seeds that the sower has cast grow up among the weeds. But I asked this morning, first sir, I said, somebody explain to me why weeds always win. Come over to my backyard. I'll show you what I mean. We had a bunch of grass planted. They said, this is really strong grass, St. Augustine. This will kill anything. And what do we have right now? We've got weeds all over the place. Like, what happened to this? How is it that weeds always win? So one of the physicians in first service came to me after and said, I'll tell you why it is. Because weeds only have one purpose, grow up. The good plants have the purpose of growing up and bearing fruit. It makes it harder to grow. I have no idea if that's right, but it sounds good. So I'm <laughs> telling you. So the weeds end up winning, and they end up choking the good plants. So sooner or later, those are also dead. So now the first three soils are in trouble, but then we come to the last one. And this soil, Jesus says, is fertile soil, and the seeds grow and become fruitful. Then when he finishes that, he says, let the one who has ears hear stand for the benediction. And that's where he ends. It's like, what, what was that? I mean, over in Mark's gospel, it's even more pungent. Because Mark portrays, once he's done with that, everybody stood for the benediction, everybody got in their cars to drive home, the disciples get him off in the room and they say, what in the world were you talking about? Is this kind of, some kind of farming lecture? What? I don't understand what that means. What are you suggesting? People went home bewildered. So this is what Jesus says, as if this now is going to clear things up. Verse 9, his disciples asked him what this parable meant. Mark, when they're all alone in a room, asked him. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that, and then he quotes Isaiah, though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. Oh, well, yeah, good. What was that? I don't understand that either, Jesus. <laughs> Craig Keener says this, New Testament scholar, he says, Jewish teachers normally use parables to illustrate and explain points, not to conceal them. But if one told stories without stating the point they were meant to illustrate, as Jesus does here, only those who listen most astutely and start with insider's knowledge could figure out one's point. So here's what Keener is saying, that Jesus is saying, if you want to understand this, get the information that I'm extending to you, 
you're going to have to expend energy and effort and work. And you're going to have to understand as an insider that the kingdom of God works differently from the cultures in which you live. Which says, if we're going to understand this, it's not going to come to us cut up, chewed up, put in our mouth, and all we have to do is swallow. It's going to require some effort, some energy, some learning on our part. Not to receive salvation, but to understand all of its implications. Say, okay, well, hmm. But I still don't get this. Well, let's go on. Jesus is going to continue and explain. Verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes the word from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life, worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So first thing we know. Now remember, when we talked about genres back several weeks ago, we said parables are not meant to be allegories. This means this, and this means this, and this means that. Jesus does some of that here. And he starts by saying, the seed is the word of God. So we know right away that what we're dealing with here is the word. It's being sown in our hearts. How we respond to that will determine whether or not we are simply being informed or we are actually being transformed. So we're dealing with the word of God. Now, a quote from New Testament scholar R.T. France. This was really helpful to me. Listen to what France writes. Like all parables, this one could have various meanings and applications if left without interpretation. Jesus' interpretation focuses on the issue of divided response, different responses, divided response to his proclamation and explains why not all have responded positively. The first three scenes represent typical hindrances to effective response, total lack of interest, inadequate commitment, and competing priorities. The balance of the parable with its four carefully delineated scenes indicates that such a detailed analysis is intended rather than simply an assurance that there will be a harvest at the end. So what is that saying? It's saying that each of these tells us something about the soil in your heart and in mine. Okay, so let's draw from France a little bit about what he's saying here. So what he's saying, the pathway, this hard soil, represents in all of our lives a lack of interest. I'm not interested just keep moving, nothing to see here. Go tell somebody else that. I don't need it. Now, we like to think, well, that's people out there, people who are not interested. But be careful. There's a part of that in my heart and maybe in yours as well. In fact, if you go over and read Revelation, which we studied last summer, chapter 3, you come to the last message to the seven churches. You come to Laodicea. You know what the Laodiceans say? I'm rich. I'm good. I don't need anything. I'm not interested. There is a way in which we, even sitting in church seats, listening to worship music, listening to the word taught, can say, okay, well, that, that's, yeah, that's good, that's fine. That's all I want. Don't come to me with anything else. I'm not interested. So in that case, this lack of interest means that whatever's thrown out, whatever's planted there, never takes root never grows, and certainly never bears fruit in our lives. That's the first soil. The second soil, the rocky soil, that's a tough soil because, you know, it looks like it could have something that grows. It has some soil, just has a lot of rocks in it. So in this case, for what did France say? Inadequate motivation. Inadequate motivation, in other words, 
Yeah, I am really moved by what happened in worship. I was thinking as I was working on this of last week, the Easter Sabbath services were magnificent. Where I have the unique privilege of taking the men on the more traditional side, taking the men on the more modern side, and on both sides, I walked away saying, have mercy. We are so blessed. I was inspired. It's wonderful to listen to our worship leaders, our band, praise God and lead us in that praise. Deeply inspiring. But do you know what can happen with that? What can happen with that is that we reel out of here just saying, ah, that was wonderful. That was great. Somebody says something about next week. Oh, next week. And we say, oh, well, yeah, I, I got this thing next week down at the beach. Yeah, next week. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, we're, we're going out to the desert. We got the, oh, no, the music was wonderful. I loved it. I was inspired. But, and you know, that guy who spoke, yeah, yeah, I mean, no, 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 no. He, he Stay with him. He'll get you somewhere, maybe. And, and they, they try to give a sense of how inspired they were, but that's all I want. Don't need any more. As far as I'll take it. Occasional church. No root grows. Then you have the weeds. The weeds. What was it that France said? He said, this is the problem of competing priorities. Competing priorities. We all have priorities in a community like ours, in a place like this, with so much going on. You're in residency. You're in school. You're working. You're trying to get a practice going. You've just started your marriage. There are priorities all over the place. And it becomes so hard. To say the one necessary word, the fundamental word of boundary setting. I know this. So hard to simply say no. Can't do that. Can't do it. Oh, yeah, that's a really nice invocation, invitation. Man, I, I love speaking to places like that, and that's beautiful. No. <laughs> that's really tough. It's tough for you at some level, but no. In fact, a friend of mine in the church several years ago got me this little device. I don't know what to call it that I have on my desk. It's round like this, has a red button on top, and you hit it. And very loudly it says, no. <laughs> hit it again. No, no, no. Hit it again. Don't you understand? There's no way I'm doing that. And I think, well, that's a beautiful thing. But it's kind of hard to push that, you know. <laughs> And so we end up with so many priorities in our lives that we can't sort them out in order to take care of what's truly important. So somebody says, yes, I want to walk with God. I want to follow Jesus. I want to be transformed by his word in my life. But wh what did you say? Get up earlier? How early? Which days? Every day? Oh, no, no. Scripture before phone? You don't understand. i got to answer my email as soon as I get up. I can't do that. No, 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 no. And, and, and then say no to so much binging? I'm trying to figure out ways to binge more. What are you talking about? And, and, and along the way, we see i got so many things going, I don't have time for what this would require. So they both grow. The weeds, the plants... They both grow. There's another parable, by the way, another parable that Jesus tells, the one where the enemy comes and sows weeds among the plants. And in that case, possibly in this one, in that case, the weed, the Darnell weed, looks exactly like the wheat plant all the way up until the time that it, quote, unquote, bears fruit. So you can't tell which is which. I do kind of curiously wonder here if maybe that's happening. So we have a hard time figuring out what's good, what's important, what's vital. And all these competing priorities dominate us. And we just can't. Uh, I have a book I'm reading right now on discipleship. One of the best books I've read on discipleship, John Mark Comer, Practicing the Way. Somebody said when they saw me, they said, well, that's a good book. It's not as good as his other book. I said, what's that? He said, it's a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Not even sure I like that name, but okay. I said, yeah, that's good. He said, that's an excellent book. Got to read. So that's one of the next ones I'll read. But same person told me, we tried to get Comer to come here and speak to our medical students. Come talk to our medical students. And here's what we discovered. 
said when we were reaching out to him and talking to someone in his office, here's what they said to us. They said, oh, you have to understand, John Mark reads his emails on Tuesdays. <laughs> Tuesdays. I thought, well, I do that. And Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. He said, no, 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 he reads them only on Tuesdays. So if you're in a hurry, just know that's when it'll happen. Like, oh, my goodness. How does that happen? This is somebody who has gotten very serious about saying, I'm going to ruthlessly eliminate these realities from my life for the very few truly important things. Competing priorities, yes. Lack of interest, that kills it before it gets started. Inadequate motivation, I'm, I'm out of the starting gate, but quickly I'm off to the side of the track. Competing priorities, this allows me to grow and go for a while until I'm just so exhausted, so tired, I can't do what I need to do. And you know what suffers almost every time? It's the seed that was planted in your soul, not the weeds but the seeds. Now, what about this last one? This good soil. I want to reread verse 15 because here in verse 15, wow, Jesus summarizes the content, the context, the reality of that kind of soil. Here's what it says. But the seed on good soil, follow this carefully, stands for those what? With a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. Wow. That's what I want to be. That's what I pray to be. Just notice what he says. First of all, he says, these, this soil is represented in people who have a noble and good heart. They are people who hear the word. In other words, they're trying to take in the information, but it's not just for the sake of the information. It's because they're going to be changed by it. They have a noble and a good heart. They hear the word. And then a really important point, it says they retain it. They retain it. They don't let it just flitter away. And then finally, and this is something maybe we don't like to think about as much as we should. But he says, they persevere. They just keep after it. They just keep after it. They just don't stop. They persevere. And that, says Jesus, is what leads to fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. That's a great word. It's not used in this parable. But it's a word that describes what's contained in this parable. Fruitfulness. That means that you bear fruit in your life. That means that there is transformation that happens. Yes, it's based on the information, but it doesn't stop there. We don't become tadpoles. Our body grows whole and healthy because we are transformed because of these realities. Now, we could talk about fruitfulness in a range of different ways in Scripture. In the New Testament, for that matter. I want to just mention two of them. First one is this. When you think of fruitfulness in the New Testament, if you're like me, one of the first places your mind goes is to Galatians 5, to the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Now, just by the fact that it's called the fruit of the Spirit, it's not the gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit is here. Here's a gift. I'll give you a gift. I'll give you a gift. And the Spirit does that. The fruit of the Spirit isn't that way. The fruit of the Spirit grows. It takes time. It takes nurturing the soil. It takes keeping the plant healthy. That's how fruit grows. You don't plant a seed and scream over it for the next three weeks, and then you have fruit. It doesn't happen. Fruitfulness. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? It's love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, it transforms who we are. It's not just seeking to know and be right. It's seeking to be Christ-like. I'm going to disguise this carefully, but the last several weeks I've had, I was going to say the opportunity, I don't know if that's what it was, but had the 
What's a better word than that? Had the encounter with several people in two or three different contexts. We're very concerned about something. It wasn't all the same thing, but they're very concerned about something. And they're saying, we're right. This is what scripture says. This is where we stand. I want to be right. I want to have the right information. I don't want to be wrong. Understand that. But in each of these encounters, the thing that struck me most was this. Sometimes when we believe we're right, we are so mean ugly. Walking away from this, I thought, if that's, count me out, just mean, ugly people. Is this the fruitfulness Jesus is growing in your life? Is this what it means to be fruitful? Well, if we're going to be transformed, we are transformed with noble hearts that hear the word, that retain it, that persevere to become the kind of people Jesus calls every one of us to be. And that means more humble and more gracious. Yes, we believe. Yes, there's truth. But we do truth with love. That's what he calls us to. There's a second thing I think of when I think of fruitfulness, especially here in Luke's gospel, just a page or two back from what we've been looking at. Listen to what Jesus says. How can you get more concise than this? Luke chapter 6, verse 49, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You're saying, you're our Lord, Jesus. You're our Savior. We're following you. Then why don't you do what I say? You're not doing it. And he goes on there to tell the parable of the, of the man who builds his house on the sand. He says, you're calling me Lord, Lord, while you're founding everything you build in your life on shifting sand. It's just not going to work. So in each instance, he's calling us to take, as it were, the college class and make sure it's connected to life. It means we're taking what we're learning in Scripture, and by the grace and the power of the Spirit of God, it is transforming us. In fact, I would go so far as to say that we can learn all of the right rules, as scholars call it, hermeneutics, for the interpretation of Scripture. But if we miss this one, we'll be tadpoles, huge heads, underdeveloped bodies. But if we connect this one, we realize the ultimate way to truly understand Scripture is to do what it says. When Jesus calls and asks and directs, we respond. And then we understand even more deeply. And what it bases it on is what we understand accurately, but it transforms us in the process. So I want to read you the words of one Eugene Peterson. You know Eugene Peterson if you've ever read The Message, The Paraphrase of the Bible, Exceptional, or many other books that Peterson wrote, he passed away some years ago. I have a profound admiration for Eugene Peterson. Here's what he writes. At age 35, I bought running shoes and began enjoying the smooth rhythms of long-distance running. Yeah, for him. Smooth rhythm. I'm gasping and falling. But anyway, began enjoying the smooth rhythms of long-distance running. Soon I was competing in 10K races every month or so, and then a marathon once a year. By then I was subscribing to and reading three running magazines. Then I pulled a muscle and couldn't run for a couple of months. Those magazines were still all, all over the house, but I never opened one. The moment I resumed running, though, I started reading again. That's when I realized that my reading was an extension of something I was a part of. I was reading for companionship and affirmation of the experience of running. I learned a few things along the way, but mostly I read to deepen my experience in the world of running. If I wasn't running, there was nothing to deepen. The parallel with scripture reading, he writes, is obvious. If I'm not living in active response to the living God, reading about his creation, salvation, holiness won't hold my interest for long. 
The most important question isn't, what does this mean? But, what can I obey? Listen to this sentence. Simple obedience will open up our lives to a text more quickly than any number of Bible studies, dictionaries, and concordances. The primary purpose, maybe, the primary purpose of Scripture is not to inform, but to transform. And that means that when I come to the reading of the Word, I approach it with an attitude that opens my heart, my life to God and says, God, please, as I read, as I study, please, might your Spirit enter into me and form me in the ways you wish for me to be formed. Sand off the hard edges of my heart and my life. I want to understand you truly and clearly. I want to be truthful and accurate in my reading. But God, I want it to go beyond that. Make me a kind person. A humble person. Who somehow by the miracle of your grace. Represents you as well as a human being can. Just form me in those ways. I think. If we want to understand Scripture, we can learn all the right stuff. And that's important, and that helps us have the right knowledge. But you don't want to be a tadpole. I don't either. Nobody wants a big head and very little and underdeveloped body. We want to be able to be robust spiritually so that we might grow in Him every day. So is it understandable? It absolutely is. But as we leave this series, I hope we leave with the prayer. God, empower me to do what it says. Because then I will truly understand what it says.